Hey everyone, welcome to Love, Rinse, Repeat, a podcast recorded on Gay Amago land by me, Liam Miller. He, him, he is a minister in the Uniting Church in Australia. I'm also can excitedly announce that uh, you, the Love, Rinse, Repeat is now part of Unite, the uh, Uniting Church in Australia Synod's Uniting Mission and Education arm. We've come, I've come into a big family now, folks, and uh, means, you know, the look for production values to rocket up to the sky. But I thank you for them. And I have some notes at the end to talk about there. But yes, we're part of Uniting Mission and Education's vital and continuing leadership. So, but enough of that and about the podcast. I have two very cool, wonderful, uh, amazing guests on today. I have John Flett and Henning Rogerman. Uh, I think I've done it all right. Uh, and welcome, welcome, John and Henning. Thank you. Thank you. So just to give a little bit of biographical, so folks might know John's been on the podcast a few times, but he is Professor of Intercultural Theology and Mission Studies at Pilgrim Theological College, my uh, alma mater, part of the University of Divinity in Melbourne, Australia. He is the author of Apostolicity, uh, The Ecumenical Question in World Christian Perspective, and The Witness of God, The Trinity, Missio Dei, Karl Barth, and The Nature of Christian Community. Henning, is a world-renowned missiologist and scholar of religion. He holds the Chair for Mission Studies, Comparative Religion and Ecumenics at the Protestant University Wuppertal Bethel in Germany, where he also has the Institute for Intercultural Theology and Interreligious Studies. He is the, also the author of the three-part Intercultural Theology. The book that we're talking about is their co-authored Questions of Context, Reading a Century of German Mission Theology. Now, we're now with IBP Academic, which you can pick up. And I encourage you, and our conversation will surely inspire you to today. Uh, but before we get to the book, you know, I've got these world-renowned missiologists, intercultural theologians on, experts in the field. So I thought I'm going to take that opportunity to get you guys to get some real initial knee-jerk, totally unofficial responses to, uh, I guess, some of the more common refrains I tend to hear around mission uh, and, and the church's role uh, and a church's mission, uh, at least in my circles, uh, ones I come across a bit more. And perhaps this is a way of wading into why maybe it's important to read a century of German mission theology and why it's important to focus on mission, something that we'll highlight throughout. But look, you don't have to have any, you know, doesn't these final thoughts, these are just Initial responses to common refrains. The first one is, you might have heard this one before, uh, the church is the only organisation on earth that exists for the benefit of its non-members. Do you know who did that? Uh, isn't that Rana? No. <laughs> I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, it was a... Anglican uh, Archbishop, what his name is now completely escaped me, <laughs> turn, uh, turn of the 20th century, and it's sort of apocryphal. Um, what's its name? I will come back to his name. Mm -hmm. any, any thoughts on it, Henning, as a, as a refrain or as a way of capturing what mission should be? What mission should be? Well, yes. Um, I think also my personal opinion is actually mission is taking part in the glorification of the triune God, meaning that uh, mirroring the splendor of God, the splendor of Christ. And uh, so my, my idea is that uh, if people respond to so Jesus Christ, I, I would call him the love letter of, of God. So, uh, and, and these people are, uh, well, embrace Christ. Um, so they do it, or I think this is a kind, of, the beginning of a kind of love story. And if you are, if you're full of love, you you try to, well, to 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 give it to the people. So in this case, uh, it is. I, I think it is meant to be uh, for the benefit of all the world and all the people. Mm. And it doesn't uh, mean only to to focus on on well, well spiritual matters, but also worldly matters. Because if you glorify God with your, uh, with the whole body and with your whole community of people, it means that all this uh, needs to be taken into account. Mm. Mm. Thank you for that, John. In the chat, uh, updated that's William Temple who, uh, who who offered that quote, or who's is that, sorry, that quote is attributed to. Uh, 
So the next one I hear a lot is uh, the church is called to be the hands and feet of God. Initial reactions. I leave it to John. <laughs> oh, dude. Uh, but I mean, like with a lot of these things, it depends how you take it, right? The idea mm -hmm. that the church becomes, well, I mean, you could read it as saying that the church becomes the sole signifier of God. Like we're the only ones doing stuff, which I would heartily disagree with. Um, and what type of thing are you attributing to yourself if you think that's what you are? Um, something like Missio Dei will always say that God's mission's in the world and he's actually, well, God's drawing God's body beyond themselves, right? So there's a sense that the, the spirit's the thing that's actually drawing the church into the world by virtue of God being already there. So, I mean, you could read it, you could read these things as sort of saying that the church is quite often resistant to, to mm. doing that sort of thing. And it needs, it needs an impulsion that's beyond itself to actually draw it out there so that these things aren't, um, we're not the people that are controlling this. We're not the ones in, you know, we're not the ones that are the, mm. you know, the bearers of everything. So that when, you know, we're making all sorts of divine claims for actions that we're doing, which is of course highly problematic through history. Mm. So um but you, you do hear that quite a bit, right? But I don't know, what, what, hubris, pride <laughs> would be my immediate reaction. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I think, I think you, because in my mind, the image comes if you're the hands of God, you have the, that opportunity to open them to people or, or close them, which, which seems. Well, I, 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 would, I would add something. Uh, so this, uh, we are the hands of God. No, we shouldn't limit the action of God. Uh, so this is, as John said, this is hypocrisy. This is pride. This is, uh, well, this is actually heresy because we are not uh, the only, well, um, well the, the only uh, opportunity God uses to mm -hmm. work uh, in this world. So there are, there are some churches in Germany, for instance, so you, you have a kind of cross and, and, and Christ without hands and feet. And so people telling you, we are, we are the people who are, let's say, fulfilling the will of God in the world. No, 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 no. One has to be very careful about that. Uh, and uh, so for, for instance, in the church in, in Germany, if, if, if we have a, a constant church decline, you know, and if the future of the church depends on, 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 on our actions, we could only become desperate, you know, desperation will be the end. And, and this kind of Christology is, uh, well, uh, so the, the, to, it's to overemphasize a certain aspect. So the aspect is not, not entirely untrue, but it is absolutely the over, well, well no, it's an over, um, oversimplification too, I would say. I would say. Mm. One has to be careful with these big, let's say, uh, metaphors that are not biblical. Mm. Actually. Mm. Thank you for that. All right, another one that you get, it gets thrown around a bit is churches plant churches, not denominations. Churches plant churches, not denominations. Well, churches don't plant churches. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Can you expand on that? So who plants churches if churches don't? Well, there's an old, there's an old axiom that goes that God doesn't, they, no, no person has ever converted another person, only mm, God mm -hmm. converts. So, I mean, yeah, like, like yeah. so, so you're talking about a community of people that are coming together to confess something in a certain way, to witness to something, to worship something that's beyond them. So, uh, again, who's the agent? Mm. Who's, who's doing what? For what reason? Um, for sure, there's, 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 you know, this might seem a bit abstract, but there's institutional ties. I mean, there's, mm. you know, there's histories, but say, for example, you go to um, Lutherans in Tanzania, they ain't necessarily going to look like Lutherans in North Germany, right? So mm -hmm. even if you are planting a denominational um, thing, 
you know, one of them's going to be running around exercising people and the other one's going to be sitting there very, very sober on a Sunday morning. I mean, so even if you do say that something, you know, a, denom- a certain denomination comes out, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to look anything like its yeah. uh, originating force, so to speak. Mm, mm. For me, it is very interesting. That, so the, the question of agency, well, for, for instance, I as a Lutheran, would start a church that is not Catholic or Orthodox. You know, this is obviously not the case. But but anyway, the people who are interacting with me, they will well get whatever they well suits them. Maybe they will get what would criticize them. And so uh, something new uh, comes into existence. So uh, this is a question of, of agency and, and also uh, complicated uh, topic actually. Uh, but um, very interesting one, and and uh, <laughs> the idea I write a neat mission theology, and then something will happen this way, that way. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, so, but I think we will be we will talk about that later. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I, I think the takeaway from these questions, these types of things, for me is is that how cliched discussion of mission is across the board. Mm-hmm. So even from some exponents, so the way in which instead of actually drilling down into the nature of some of these questions, we're quite willing to accept our our sort of set ways of doing things and then sort of thinking about, well, what does replication look like in that? Um, Which, of course, is the very end. Well, I I mean, I would describe that as as non-missionary, as propagandistic. So you know, to what extent is mission propaganda is a different variety of question. And how do we, how do we um, interrogate that type of question? But, you know, these very cliched approaches to what's going on is just, well, it's ignorant, but it's also colonialist. So, so, which is a strange thing to say, right? Because in our part of the world, um, to be anti-mission is to be anti-colonial. Right, that's the sort of bracket that goes together. Um, Lana Sane has this really interesting, it's over a number of articles, but here's this interesting commentary where he talks about how, you know, the only people that really can say that are white liberal Westerners. And the only reason that they can say that is because one, um, they don't realize sort of all the deconstruction work that's gone around Christian theology by virtue of um, it meeting all these different cultures. So that's actually said something about the nature of Christianity itself, i.e. you don't have to be Western to be Christian. Uh, things like the good Christianity is done along with the bad. Now, Lam and Sunny is not here to actually defend sort of Western missions as you might understand them. But the, the sort of freedom to do something, the freedom to make these categorical um, statements and then the freedom to turn around and say, well, if you ever hear mission talked about in any other part of the world, that's only because they've been overrun by the great glorious West and they're incapable of responding and yada, 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 right? So for him, that's just pure colonial narrative, which is not to say right, we want to return to a period that was sort of Western imperialism, but it is to say that these questions need to be interrogated vastly more significantly than the sort of knee-jerk um, type of stuff that you're going to always start off with. Thank you for that. I think one of the things you said there, like a lot of these things just don't aren't drilling down into. One of the things that that really struck me with the book is is the introduction. I think is such a helpful chapter in its own right. Like if you were not even going to like actually engage the whole uh, you know main focus of the book, just in the sense of the way that you both identify, clarify, and complicate some of the you know really main key ways that people are thinking about the content, the question of contextualization and culture and the relationship of culture to the gospel and thus to mission is, is really very helpful in, you know, there's just a point where you go, you talk about one of these key axioms being uh, that, I just want to get it right, um, it belongs to the gospel to become and be local um, great. And then you go, but immediately here are a bunch of ways that in practice, this becomes vastly more complicated, more interesting, more, et cetera. And I'll come back to that part in a second, more specifically, but I was just curious about, you know, making the decision to begin writing this book and before even being able to get to, we want to talk about the absence of the theories of contextualization in German mission theology. 
we need to talk about, <laughs> we need to like clear some ground and lay some foundations. Can you talk a bit about what led to that and, and what you're hoping that kind of initial overview uh, helps as the reader progresses into this book? Uh, I missed the question. So I guess what led to the, like going, this is how we have to start. We can't just start with, here's the first couple of theologians and missiologists we're going to look at. We need to actually establish a lot of this. Um, and I guess the relationship of that too, as you say, you know, there's so few people actually are doing this digging into the assumptions undergirding a lot of mission talk. Do you, do you want me to go first, Henny? Mm -hmm. uh, so... So why would anyone read a book about a hundred centuries of German mission theology? Like, could you even imagine a more dull topic? <laughs> so it's like, so the, the point is the precise opposite of the idea that this is, these are the authorities and mm. this is how they've done it over time. The, so the book's actually predicated on a very significant error. And it's trying to drill down about why this error occurred and what are the consequences of this error. So it's actually looking at why German mission theology would, was seriously mistaken in its own parameters for a long period of time as a way of sort of um, having enough cultural distance from where we are to be able to look at how we're doing things. Mm. So the, the first chapter becomes a way of sort of saying, you know, we're really, really confident in this language of context, mm. but what is it? Like, we, like we use context all the time. We use it in yep. terms yep. like space or place or context or whatever it is, but it's only a word that's come into being since the 1960s, really. And, you know, um, I was reading an article by um, Siona Javier the other day called Con and Context. And he was saying, you know, in Arnett land, they don't have a word for context. And then he started thinking, well, in Tonga, we don't have a word for context either. We end up using these five different words. Mm -hmm. So even the idea of context itself has all of these projections put into it about what we expect it might look like or, 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 um, or how we should approach it. Mm -hmm. Even though it's the you know, dominant, dominant way of us sort of pressure releasing our valve to sort of say, oh, well, we're being contextual, when in actual fact, you may not be. You might be completely mm. projectionist and sort of saying, look, I really like to make it completely, pre uh, to make it really, you know, out there, to what extent is contextualization simply us reaffirming a Western way of going about things and saying, this is what you have to do in this local place in order to be authentic Christians, mm. like contextual. So, the problematizing at the beginning of the book is trying to grab, from my perspective, is trying to grab people who are uh, really confident about when they're using the language of context, that they're doing it in a way that's open and just and right and really aiming at the right things, because it might not be. Mm -hmm. Henning, do you have anything you want to add to that? I was thinking particularly as you've been working on intercultural theology for some time now, I guess, somewhat overlapping with this book and thinking about like, you know, particularly trying to lay out some of those gospel culture, like, and problematizing some of that confidence as, as, as John puts it. Well, uh, yes, uh, I, I would like to add, uh, well, about the personal, also the story of John and me. Mm. So, um, uh, <laughs> well, this is a, it's a very interesting thing that John uh, all the time tried to make me understand how different contexts work. You know, for instance, Australia, New Zealand, uh, the United States. And on the other hand, uh, I tried to make him understand what Germans, Europeans, and so uh, think. What so? What what are the concepts? What are the the prejudices? What are the well the hidden meanings and so mm -hmm. on, so on, so on. And so I think we learned a great deal from each other. And then we went to, uh, well, to Congo, for instance, and other places, and deepened this conversation. And with lots of new observations, we, 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 we problematized uh, all these issues. And then and also we are, so I'm, well, let's say, uh, I know a little bit about European and German mythology and all this stuff, and John, knows a little bit uh, about all what's going on in the rest of the world. And so uh, we found 
there is actually no conversation between the Anglo-Saxon or mythology and the German or continental uh, mythology. And, and I think it would be very, or it is actually a joke, you know, it's a joke that these people who are concerned with, uh, well, uh, <laughs> crossing borders mm. are not even able uh, to, con to have a, a proper conversation uh, about uh, uh, this, these topics uh, well, between the Anglo-Saxons and the continental Europeans. Mm. And I'll leave aside when the Eastern Europeans, for instance. So we have had a wonderful conference conducted by John and Dorothea Nagy uh, in, um, in Romania in Cluj. And it was so interesting to see the, the, all the colleagues from Eastern and uh, European countries, high sexual license, so uh, in an in, in Orthodox environment here and there. Uh, so totally different, well, observations, approaches, questions. And so, so, so this book is actually uh, the, uh, the the attempt to 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 keep this or to to encourage this kind of dialogue between mm. different groups of mythologists worldwide. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, so something else, and I, I hinted at this just in there. You're talking about this whole understanding that yes, the gospel, you know, it belongs to the gospel to become and be local. Uh, but then, you know, a lot of the question being about like, well, how much so and to what limits are there? And is there some unchangeable, consistent gospel that that part can't, but everything else can change? And and in amongst that, not that you're kind of solving those questions, you have another part in the intro where you talk about like the fears of over contextualization. And I think you make a very helpful point where you say how those fears are always leveled at someone else. Like it's always like we're worried about things being over contextualized in country over, or culture over there and never that kind of self reflection of the way we have over contextualized uh, the gospel and and we have accommodated the gospel uh, to, to aspects and so. I get, and, and one kind of key thing that you point out is uh, you write that it can actually be accounts of contextualizations that can reinforce our own improper accommodation of the gospel. And I guess, John, you started to maybe say a bit about that before, but I was just curious about that, um, you know, because I think we can all understand that a whole like thing of only worrying about what's over there. But I was curious about how, you know, trying to be contextual and to understand that all theology is developed in its time and place and all that kind of thing, we're all located beings, how that actually can, you know, subvert maybe the efforts people think it's trying to do. Well, concerning over contextualization, contextualization, I would like to start with some mm. examples from the well, um, middle European uh, German context. So I think that we are in danger that that um, whatever you call a gospel, so how do you define the gospel, gets over contextualized in our country. So this uh, so this tendency to, to identify uh, the gospel was a kind of liberal approach. Uh, that is not um, countercultural anymore. Mm -hmm. So we, we try to be in line with our, so, so this, so, so we, we have a highly contextual, uh, sexualized, well, milieus and contexts. And if you respond to that in just avoiding any, well, awkward question or symbol, if you don't preach about, well, blood, sin, sex, whatsoever, temptation, uh, redemption, the gospel, it's boring, you know, if, 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 if a sermon is nothing more than uh, to, to re-brew uh, the, 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 the news from the last evening, so, well, in, in Germany it's Heute Journal, you know, uh, or Tagesschau, uh, then the people get bored. And so this is, a, for me, it is, uh, so if there is, so if, 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 the, if, if they don't say anything anymore, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, so this, this is a kind of over contextualization. So, and I would say, for in my understanding, the kind of theology of the cross is the center of cross Christian theology, no matter how you contextualize it. So because it is, Countercultural in a way, and, and and the other thing is that if you skipped the Trinitarian creed, you will get in in deep deep trouble. 
because all these different uh, dogmatic decisions of the church have been made uh, as a response to challenges that are in a way similar to the challenges we today have. So for instance, uh, the gnosis, or the, it's, it's similar to the to today to the esoteric scene, you know, and and so uh, I think this is worth to be uh, to be dealt with this, mm. these questions. Yes, yes, my opinion. Yeah, great. <laughs> uh, are you going to focus on chapter three at all? Uh, yeah, I think was, um, we're going to come into that in a little. Yes. So I, I think that's the best way to answer your question. Yep. So the Nazification of German missions, because yep. the Nazification of German missions was... Um, so part, one of the things that we sort of translate is an article by Siegfried Knack. I first discovered this article um, and a series of uh, letters exchanged, funny enough, between Bart and Knack um, in the 30s. But I discovered it when I was at Princeton. And... Uh, this essay has never been translated. So what mm. I did, what I did was I translated it and changed all the Nazification language to American freedom language. Right. So I used it as a teaching tool, and uh, it's this essay has got a whole range of of information about how how God works through culture. Mm. Like how is it that God works? So what does God do in creation? What does do God do in culture? What does God do in the orders of creation? You know, and, and you, you eliminate the blood and soil language, but you start putting in the sort of Amer middle America, second amendment mm. type of things. And it was really interesting because it was like boiling frogs. <laughs> Because you just get students to read um, some of the material and then you go, okay, stop. And then you'll go, do we agree with this? Mm. So at, at what point do we agree with it, right? Is that good? Is that how God works? God works through creation to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah, yeah, we agree with that. So God works in this way. This is what it looks like in context. Yeah, yeah, we agree with that. And then you get to the very end of the essay and you say, well, this was a pro-Nazi um, Christian text talking about how the Nazis were actually Christianizing Germany. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you get the, mm, how, how did we get, how did we get to that type of point, yeah. right? Mm. So, so we have in this notion of context and in this notion of contextualization, actual real theological limits about how we think what, what we think context is. So when I say context, what am I talking about? We immediately mm -hmm. go to culture, culture is artifact or culture is what? Uh, we tend to leave out sort of religious commitment. And then we go straight to things like law or mores or customs or ritual, which somehow we think we can lift outside of all of the other things that go around it. We can sort of, you know, commodify them and use them as we want. And then you start to just keep on drilling down and you realize that the, the very way in which we're using the language of context or contextualization has a whole view of the world behind it. So, and it's linked to notions of what does it mean to be an embodied person? Like what's the materiality of human beings? What do we need in order to be? So that gets immediately related to, well, what's context? And then we start to drill all the way down and you realize that it gets really easy for cultures to actually pick up. Well, this is, this is what we think embodiment is. We, this is where we think value lies. So you start talking about what is contextualization like, looks like. Well, it looks like education. Right? If I'm going to go somewhere and I'm going to contextualize the gospel, we're going to start educating. And then it looks like, well, village structures like romantic village structures of things that occurred before um, colonization or industrialization happened. So it's got this utopian backwards reference, which has been really, really bad for indigenous cultures, because it's basically saying for you to be authentic indigenous, you actually have to go back and live, you know, 400 years ago and be happy there. So what is context? What is contextualization? All of a sudden drills down backwards into a range of theological commitments that we're making. And you'll find that they actually, people articulate these theological commitments. Like how does the law function in relation to the church? What does it look like to actually be an embodied community? What's the role of the sacraments? So all of that theology 
finds this sort of visible expression, and this is what context is. But the thing that we learned from this period within German history is that it goes really horrible, or it has the potential to go really horrible really quickly, even when we think, right? And the beauty of the German position is that they thought that they were actually being really, really attentive to local culture. Right. So they talked about the German charism in a way that the British came along and they sort of just made everyone learn English, do X, Y and Z. Now, the extent to which that sort of thing's true is debatable. But, you know, they actually thought this was the German charism, that we were so attentive to culture in this way. This is how we've understood it. Um, and then it just goes, you know, then you just get this. That's why we could so to quote Siegfried Knack from that essay. That's why we can say a joyful yes to the totalitarian claims of the Nazi state. Yeah. Right. So yeah. that that moment that moment you sort of sit back and you go, okay, then how how did we actually end up at that point? Mm -hmm. uh, I would add, um, and we are we are now living in an era where nationalism is becoming uh, a force uh, once again. And so uh, if uh, Christians uh, now would take the same, well, approach, saying that, oh, this is our, well, heritage or Christian heritage and so and so, and it is better than la la la. So we, are, we will end up exactly at that point. And so this is for me a very interesting studying, uh, well, uh, mission theology and all this stuff. Uh, to see that the, precisely the same mistakes occur again and again and again. And no theory so far uh, is a kind of safeguard against these uh, misunderstandings. And uh, so this, uh, this makes it uh, very mm. interesting to go, uh, as, as, uh, <laughs> as John said, to, mm. to drill deep. Mm. I think that's really helpful. So yeah, I was going to, you know, lead into this. And so I think we'll stay here now that we're here talking a bit about, you know, because we often think of, okay, so the bad thing of mission is what you're saying was the taking of what we have out there and enforcing it out there. And what's good is when you just kind of attend to who you are, focus on your particularities rather than assuming kind of a, you're part of a generalized white Western thing. And, and that indigenization is a, is a much more positive view of mission because you're not messing with anyone else's business to some extent. Um, but, you know, what, what you're showing there is it was exactly that. And you, 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 know, you talk about it elsewhere with, uh, with Bruno Gutmann. Um, this kind of, you know, it was that very much that focus on this is how actually we can you know, heal our own and, and find our own culture that, you know, that will elevate us, but then actually leads into this horrible you know, war machine and death. And, um, and I think that's, again, when you talk about these, these lessons is because you see now as often as a way of people trying to attend to, you know, the colonial baggage and attend to what's happened, go, you know, what we, what we need to do is go more finely tuned into the history of our traditions. I know we'll go to Celtic Christianity, right? Or I know we'll go to, we'll try to discover something more specific to us and, and kind of return to that. And that will be our way out of this kind of, repeating those colonial things but as you're saying is no that path also has led to ruin and so i guess I'd, yeah I'd talk about that a bit too so do you have any questions about christian Kaiser? no so let's go there <laughs> so, so i thought well i was well i shouldn't have because they, they're pretty kind but i thought ivp might eliminate it from the book because at the end of the Nazification of German Missions chapter, I have a little discussion about a guy called Christian Kieser. Christian Kieser um, is from Neuendettislau in, in Germany. Um, in the early part of the 20th century, he went to a missionary, he went as a missionary to the northern eastern part of what is now Papua New Guinea. Mm -hmm. And he was a really, uh, he was a Lutheran missionary and he, and he was really highly respected by the locals. Um, he wrote a book called Aina Papua Gomainda, which basically means a, a Papuan community. Um, he comes back to Germany, um, you know, with all the war and the repatriation things, and basically becomes the head of all the German mission societies. Now, he's fairly notorious for saying, I thank God that today I'm a Nazi, 
because it's the fulfillment of all my mission theory. Right? So, um, and he's the head because he's a fairly sympathetic figure. He becomes the head of the German Mission Society through to 1948, I think it is. In which case, he sort of kicked off all the councils and he sort of disappears. He dies in the mid 60s. He disappears, but I've not been able to find any archives and I've not been able to find any anywhere that he recants any position mm -hmm. he has. He sort of just disappears and, and he's out of there. Now, Christian Case is interesting because of a guy called Donald McGavran. Donald McGavran is a, the um, father of church growth theory and mm -hmm. was very an, a highly evangelical figure who um, began the fullest school of world mission, which is now the school of Ev uh, intercultural theology. So he's a really, really key figure in the church growth theory thing, which of course takes off amongst evangelicals. It's still, pick, it's still picked up and used today. You still find things like the homogenous unit principle as part of um, the discussion about missional, uh, sorry, fresh expressions and what it looks mm. like. Right? This is where it gets just, just beautiful. He picks up Case's work in the, eight, in the late 70s and gets it translated. And it gets translated as a people reborn. And he writes an introduction saying, oh, yeah, there was this Nazi problem, Gosh. but it's completely overblown. And Christian Case's is ex uh, understanding is exactly what I mean by homogenous Eunice principle and how we should be thinking about mission today. So you've got a, a, a German mission theorist who sees in Nazism the fulfillment of his mission theory that gets picked up by an evangelical American, translated as a book and disseminated as like one of the key texts of theoretical texts of church growth theory. So that ends up like swimming its way through the waters. But then you start hearing all this rhetoric, and this is the stuff so from contemporary America. You start hearing all this rhetoric about heartland. So that the material that you've got from Bruno Gutmann is replicated like in a lot of American Christian rhetoric about how you, know, you need to stay away from the sort of liberal sides because they're not really America. They're sort of on the, you know, they're on that sort of diluted, <laughs> diluted stage. And they're just interested in these sort of things, which is exactly what Bruno Gutmann's saying. I mean, it's identical language. And then we go to the heartland and then we do X, Y, and Z. So it's not simply that there are like funny mirror images. It's like there's a genealogy of ideas that pop up in the strangest of places. So in writing the text, the point was to actually say, like this is the, the, like when you're a kid, right? And you point a figure and your parents say, look, there's, there's like three fingers pointing back. Like it's, it's, you know, oh, those guys did that. But the point is, yeah, okay, they did that. But what are we doing and how have we thought about it? So, so it, it's an odd text, right? German, 100 years of German mission theory. But the point is, it's actually a, a mirror. That's what it's designed to be. It's a mirror about actually where are we and what, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I would like to add that uh, if you take the example of, of India, for instance, and you apply these uh, homogeneous uh, units points principle to the context, you will say, well, uh, the most efficient mission is along the lines of a certain case. So this means affirming yes. this kind of discrimination, uh, so higher case against lower case and so on, so on, so on. And the, the church becomes exactly so a replication of this discriminatory structure. So, and, and the question is, uh, true mission is not, so like the Germans said after the Second World War, uh, the, the true mission mustn't be only, or is it's not, it, it is not necessarily on the side of the, the big number of people. So maybe uh, it is, uh, well, well, um, it signifies a uh, true mission, so to say, a true gospel, if the church does not grow that fast because it is a kind of quality we need. Mm -hmm. So for instance, for the, for the context of India, uh, it would be uh, very nice if we would have a congregation or uh, well, comprising of uh, people from different cases, uh, even though it's a very, very, very difficult. But this, once again, the question, uh, if you define culture as su such a kind of uh, enlightenment culture, 
so an universal enlightenment culture, human rights and so. So this, yeah, yes, this is mm. universal. If you go down and say, well, actually, this is a local culture. Uh, so mission has to relate to both of it. And how do you do that? Mm. How do you do that? Mm. No, thank you for that. But, I mean, raising the question is maybe one step one, the first step, mm. uh, and, 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 and if you omit this, these questions, if you just uh, stay with a pragmatic agenda, uh, this becomes at a certain point, uh, well, <laughs> very difficult, not only for, for, for all of people, so. Yes. Another part in the book, you, you talk about some of the shift scene across the century and that there was this push then to remove uh, the quote, you know, the accidental motivation for mission. So, you know, it's not just about, oh, we've discovered a new country uh, or, oh no, the church is shrinking uh, or, or whatever it is. It's not just, it's trying to move away from that. Um, uh, so, but I want to talk a bit about that move because again, in terms of what we're thinking and learning, I still think accidental motivation is, is generates a lot of missional ideas and thinking in, in, in the church that I'm a part of, in the sense, of particularly decline and growth, decline, um, or, or changes in property, you know, oh, we suddenly have this opportunity because a property is now vacant, you know, like it still seems like that is a lot of the language and the impetus or um, staffing, become, you know, like a lot of this still becomes the impetus for a lot of missions. So I'm just curious a bit about that, that move, trying to move away from accidental motivation. And I know it is, you, you problematize it, that it wasn't just, it led to its own set of problems. But again, maybe some of those lessons and how they inform, you know, a lot of the common thinking today again as well. Okay. Um, so yes, we continue the uh, <laughs> the accidental approach to, to doing mission. Um, and part of the reason, well, I, so, the first thing I want to say is that when people think about mission, you've got to ask, what have they got in their brain? Mm -hmm. And more often than not, they're going to think like that in, in our church community, you, you're going to get a number of people who will immediately go to colonial foreign missions. And they will divide out these things that used to be back in the day known as inner mission. That is mission that occurs within already christianized lands right already that's a problem like a hugely problematic hugely problematic distinction because it's all based on the civilization of the savage over there whereas we just need mm. you know we just need to sort of get up to speed on what we already are now the reason so that's the first thing the, the reason that becomes a problematic question is because anytime i get asked to go somewhere in australasia to talk about mission you always ask, start, start off by saying, how many of you ministers who have been in ministry for X number of years have ever read anything about mission? Hmm. And how many of you have ever preached any sermons that have anything to do with mission? Right? So if that is zero, <laughs> which, which can possibly happen, hmm. right? you're not finding any of this material within the biblical text, right? You're not, you're not finding like Pentecost. What do you do on Pentecost Sunday? Like what type of sermon are you preaching on Pentecost Sunday? Is it all about the sort of benefits that accrue to you? Cause I pretty much guarantee there's going to be a fair amount of that that's in there. But that means you've never studied mission, but you are really, really self-confident in the fact that you are non-colonialist because you've rejected mission. So you've rejected mission. So you are one of the enlightened few that are able to say a hundred years later, I know that these errors occurred, therefore I'm not part of it without realizing by accidentally, right, by using accident to motivate your mission, you are doing exactly the same thing. And the reason that you are doing exactly the same thing is because you've made mission external to the gospel. Mission becomes something that's motivated by single mothers down the road, the need to repair the church organ, the need for a new roof, 
you know, you name it, the church is in decline, whatever it is. And so you're using all of these external means to motivate mission, which means the form of mission is the form that's required to answer those problems. So if part of our mission is the renewal of our organ, right? The strategy for mission becomes who are the people that can go out there with the little cans or whatever, or what type of thing can we, you know, can we have some Bart's concerto or something that comes along and, and plays in our church in order to get cash? And that becomes mission. Hmm. Well, no, that's not mission. That's something very, very different. So if you're not thinking about actually what is a theology of mission? What does it mean for God to be beyond God's self? What does it mean fundamental ideas like witness what when so social justice is social justice part of the church's mission if so how are we actually integrating that through our theology and thinking about it what type of witness do we think is occurring there and these are discussions that center in the congregation and in teaching and in preaching and in reflecting upon it because this has to be internal to the gospel itself it has to be internal to who god is so Missio Day is one of the things that sort of reacts against it. But one of the things I ask my students is if, if God is missionary. So one of the claims, the ecumenical claims affirmed by Catholics, Orthodox, Protestants, if one of the claims is that God in God's very being, by virtue of God being Father, Son, and Spirit, is missionary. So missionary in God's being. When does mission end? Well, mission ends when God ends, <laughs> right? Yeah. So if mission ends when God ends, what, what does that actually say about who we are as human beings, who we are in relation to creation, who we are in relation to our neighbors? Mm. And the point is that if you just link mission to this notion of judgment, right? The reason that you're going to, we're going to go on mission because we're going to get these souls. These souls are going to be saved from internal fires. We're going to then, then move on to the eschaton and it's going to be completely different. That means you've linked mission only ever to judgment and it's only ever secondary to the gospel and it's only ever based on the type of judgments that we therefore make about other people. Mm -hmm. So it becomes, it becomes based in civilization. It becomes based in colony. It becomes based in all these sort of things. Why on earth would our gentrified churches care about the renovation of an organ unless this is where their value system lies and their idea of mission is actually to get that value system reinforced through the recovery of an organ because everyone's going to start coming to church when they can start hearing our wonderful organ again <laughs> of course now i'm sermonizing but <laughs> the point is that how how do we actually invite the entire church into a different discussion about what is the nature of mission? What is mission? Mm. How are we theologizing about it? And yes, I agree. As soon as we get a church building and we get cash, we think, oh, yeah, there we go. We're off and running. But that might not at all be the best um, way of going about it. Well, and this is exactly the question that um, is at the core of the problems of the German mainland churches today. So they have all these facilities still, but they are running out of money and they are running out of members, not running out, but shrinking and so on, so on, so on. People are frustrated to a certain extent. And the question is not how to start a new program. So the question is, why are we here? Mm. What, what is our basis? You know, what is our basis? So if, if your basis is that you have to achieve or well social justice and so on, so on, so we have to ask the question, if I die tomorrow, for them. So the question is, if mission, so my, my understanding it is our mission is grounded in our, so the doxology, hmm. glorifying God. Um, so then, well, I can die glorifying God, you know. So this gives me the strength uh, to be to be still uh, well, a Christian, to have still a meaning in what I'm doing, what I'm believing. So, and I, I, I would like to share this. I would like 
that other people get opened to embrace this wonderful faith. But mm -hmm. if I die tomorrow, so uh, <laughs> I know that that the, the, the gospel is not dependent on me. And so mm -hmm. I think this is a very, so in my understanding, this missiological question starts with a, a proper self-understanding of the Christian faith. What is actually, what does it mean to believe? So what, what, what is, what is, uh, what about this God, and what, what, what does He want me to to respond? How do, does He want to re me to respond? All these questions. Mm. So these are at the core. Um, hmm. mm. So, so the, the the actual crisis in Germany is a spiritual crisis, so to say, yeah. in my understanding, mm. and all the rest so is these all these pragmatic questions. This is the next step. Mm. Um, yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, we're coming in toward the end, but I think it, you know, just wanted to highlight one other point that you talk about, which I think has implications for today, is when you turn to uh, Theo Sundermeyer uh, and the idea of living together with the stranger and and moving toward the other. Uh, and I think one of the things, you know, because uh, you kind of talk about the book about how this is sometimes, you know, branded as a kind of passive. Uh, approach and so is not you know appreciated in all in all circles but one thing you offer is the way and that I was thinking is the way that this pushes against the idea of um, mission as the purview of a specialist um, be it a specialist agency be it a specialist individual who we give money to because it is about the all of us living together with our neighbors and each other um, in a way that is you know in dialogue and conversation and transforms that way. And I think that's, again, one of those ones where, you know, speaks into this other context today of where we still, you know, there may be a bit less of, we give our money to, um, you know, John and Jen over in wherever, still happens, but a bit less. And, but still it's more like, well, yes, we have the church and we have this arm of our church that is, you um, set apart to do X, Y, and Z when we fund them. So I think, I just wonder, you know, as we kind of move toward closing, thinking about that and Sundermeyer and, and that move and how you see that speaking to today. Theo Sundermeyer was um, Henning's doctor father and habilitations father, so perhaps he wants to go first. <laughs> so I, I think that the most important idea behind uh, this, um, term convivence, um, in Deutsch heißt es convivence, in German it's convivence and in English convivency, um, is that, so the understanding the church is not always the one who is, well, let me solve your problems. Liam, you have problems, I see it, I will solve your problems. La, 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 la. <laughs> Meaning that the church is always, or the people of the church are always the people who are enlightened and know everything, and all the others are people we are caring for. That means we, we are ahead of them. Mm. So in this, uh, you, you can find this in the, so in, in these ecumenical intercultural relations, you can find it everywhere. Actually, we are superior. We are going to help you poor people from wheresoever. Mm. And so the, the understanding of convivency is actually, oh, let's uh, live together, uh, first of all, and, and not trying to, well, to, 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 to claim that we are superior. And, and let's uh, learn, also kind of mutual learning and, and, and having well, peace together and working together and so and so and so. And uh, so to, to embody so, so the gospel in a way that we actually live together and we, testimony, uh, we testify when, it, when there is a certain, let's say, situation that is appropriate. So there's a small saying from mm -hmm. Theo, Theo Sundermeyer is saying that Mission geschieht am Küchentisch. So mission happens at the kitchen table, actually. And this is very nice. So I think mm -hmm. this, this kind of mythology that you could um, put into these uh, kind of wisdom, it is, I think this is a very important 
way to teach massology mm. today. Uh, not, not only with the big theories or mm, the proper theories, but also this kind of wisdom. Uh, so, and, but, but the concept of convivency is exactly that. So it is it's a, a broad concept that criticizes a, a whole lot of different approaches that are all based on the idea of the super, superior, superiority of these people who are witnesses, you know, or who are missionaries. Mm. I think that's good because that, you know, as you say, critics, both those who think the superiority lies in we have the path to salvation and, and through our theology, and also those who where it lies in the um, we can help you solve socioeconomic, political, um, whatever issue number one, two through seven, um, you know, liberal and conservative both kind of can, can enter in um, through that kind of lens, um, you know, even if you think that your motives are more pure than than your opponents. Yes, but, but but one has to be careful. This doesn't not mean that you are just keep silent. Mm, mm. No, it is yes. you, you, we have to say, to share something, but we have yes. to point to that. Mm. It's not us, but we have to point to that. So if you if if so, I'm I'm really uh, really concerned about uh, Christians here in Germany that are not really willing to to share something. Mm. So they are hesitant hesitant to do that because well, if I if I bother somebody, blah blah blah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know whether I will bother something until I have tried to share something. And this has to be to, to do with sensi sensitivities, with uh, tactfulness, so to say. Um, but but uh, so conviolence mm -hmm. does not mean just mm -hmm. to keep silent. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. Thank you. So in Germany, we have here and there people who are concerned that we could bother anybody. <laughs> and so Theo Sondermeyer actually said, we have these three dimensions, convivency on the one hand, so this is a basis and a kind of dialogical style and mission meaning also proclaiming the gospel or, or sharing the gospel. So a mission, dialogue and a convivency. And in German context, we will find here and there concerned church boards, things that, well, actually we not only need convivency, but we skip mm. mission and, and maybe even dialogue. Mm. So um, this is not enough. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Mm. Uh, one of my big bugbears, of course, is uh, the way in which we don't use the biblical text. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> if, if you say mission in the Bible, what's the first things that come into your head? Great commission, baby. Great commission, right, Matthew? Matthew 28. So I'm always, I'm always sent, uh, I'm invited to uh, <laughs> preach on when the lexicon goes to the Great Commission, because it's the only text, <laughs> right? So they don't necessarily get the sermon they're expecting. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I try and do, because they always use that as the benediction at the end as well, I, I make them stand up and in really uncomfortable pews, turn around and face the door. <laughs> And then you give the blessing from behind to go into all the world. Now, they really like the triumphal notion of, of how they're reading Matthew at that point, which I think is completely false. But they don't like even the discomfort of getting up and turning around. Mm. So you get hate emails. <laughs> like, uh, like the benediction should be from the front. I should receive something. It's all about what I receive. So what are you witnessing to? Like, and why do you want people to become members of the church? Is it simply to confirm you in your own value system? So one of the best mission texts in the entirety of the biblical text is if we speak but have no love, we're a clanging symbol. <laughs> yeah. Now, what that means is the thing that we are witnessing to is this community that has this radical structure of what does it mean? So during Greg, what does it mean to be completely religiously different? Mm -hmm. But in this community, what does it mean to be neither male nor female? So complete gender difference and in this community. And there you've got to include the range of gender difference, right? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be slave or free? Mm -hmm. So the huge socioeconomic difference that doesn't count like materially in this community. Now we know that's a dead set lie. Mm -hmm. We know that our communities are completely structured around this ongoing thing 
But the thing that we are witnessing to is the falsehood of that. Mm -hmm. So if you're not actually doing that, which is what convivience is telling you to do, it's simply saying, do that. And if you have a community that is in fact doing that, you are talking about life. You are talking about joy. You are talking about peace. Mm -hmm. You are talking about patience. You are talking about forbearance, i.e. you're talking about the fruit of the spirit. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, that's a very, very, that let's, that's as deep a missionary strategy as you're ever going to get. So do that and struggle with it. Like if you want to talk about contextualization, it's talking about becoming that community that's embodying, embodying those material values in a certain type of way. And you're doing it because you are called in a certain type of way. Mm. So that's what it's trying to aim at. And then, but we don't want to do that because that's really hard. And we all know, we all know people have left the church simply because we're a bunch of hypocrites. Right. And they don't trust us to do what we say that we're going to do. And what we would rather do is spend money on programs and call that mission, right? It's, it's completely inverted, but it's really difficult to come in. So people will get that idea straight off. I mean, that's not a hard idea to get, but it's difficult to come in and move them from those set patterns, which is another sort of realm of discussion of why are we in those set patterns? But to try and get people that really hard ask to say, this is actually what it means to move beyond yourself. That's really where the, um, the difficulties, the challenges lie. Thank you for that. I think that's a handy spot to end. Uh, I want to hold up the book, even though I'm in complete darkness now, because the sun is setting and I forgot to turn on the light. Uh, the book, as John said at the beginning, you might have thought it was going to be a tough sell to me to tell you why you would want to pick up a book on reading a century of German mission theology. But I really do think this interview will hopefully have shown why it is important to engage this, uh, why it is important to read these works closely and consider what uh, and how the distance from then to now helps shine some light and, and wake us up in, our, in, in so many of our current assumptions. So the book, Questions of Context, Reading a Century of German Mission Theology, out now with IVP academic John and Henning. Thank you very much for joining me today. It's been a delight and a pleasure. And uh, anything else you want to promote or plug or draw people's attention to? Uh, Go study theology, specifically missiology. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You can check yeah. out in, in, in the show notes, you can see their other books as well, which are all great. And especially if you want to go deeper, excellent. Uh, Henning's three volume intercultural theology, John's witness of God and apostolicity, both wonderful. And yeah, as uh, John uh, said, neglect of mission, this is from the book, only results in fundamental errors in our theological systems. So yes, go study theology and read missions missiology so thanks john thanks henning and thanks everyone we'll see you next week thank you thank you